it's scary and i think for the last couple of weeks i feel it more because before mm, like before new year uh, i didn't feel scared especially because we're near the seaside and there are a lot of dogs that they want the black sea like to control the sea part so mm, odessa is the big target In an early morning address, Russian President Vladimir Putin announced what he called a special military operation. Russian military vehicles quickly invaded the country on three sides, from Russia, Crimea and Belarus. Rocket and missile attacks and airstrikes began hitting Ukraine, bringing death and destruction to the country as a full-scale war begins. Good evening, I'm Matt Ingram with a CHCH News special report on the war in Ukraine. The invasion is the largest military action in Europe since the Second World War, and by some estimates has already caused tens of thousands of deaths. I've been speaking with Ukrainians on the ground who are witnessing the war firsthand, and tonight we are bringing you their stories as they navigate a crisis that continues to grow worse. Explosions and gunfire outside of Kyiv as Russian forces moved on the Ukrainian capital in the opening hours of the war. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky saying the government is offering weapons to anyone who wants to defend the country. Boom, like something boom. 26-year-old scientist Oleg Kuzmenko and his girlfriend hear the commotion from their central Kyiv apartment. There was no fighting in their neighborhood then, but Russians had already reached the suburbs to the north and northwest. Gunfire rang out just north of the city center as Russian and Ukrainian troops clashed on the streets. There are a lot of Russian tanks, uh, a lot of uh, militaries. Um, really scary. Many people headed for subway stations and bomb shelters to seek cover, entire families huddling together wherever they could. Kuzmenko just can't believe the invasion is actually happening. I feel it's un unfair because we live in peace, everything was fine, and then, I, I don't know what to say. But we, we know about situation for the last uh, eight years uh, in Donbass, in Lugansk. Um, it's, it's difficult. He would escape the city in the coming days and head west like many other Ukrainians. Long lines of people board trains at Kyiv's railway station, while thousands more got in their cars, packing highways out of the city. Even though it was the danger and the risk, we decided, OK, we have to drive now because we don't know what's going to happen next. Despite the risk of being out on the city streets as bombs were falling, Irina Dobrohorska made the decision to leave Kyiv and drive west with friends on the second day of the war. All of the gas stations, they were either closed or those that were open, they were full of lines. Dobrohorska says she and her partner slept in shifts the night before she left, so someone would always be awake to warn of any incoming fire. I would sleep two hours, then I would be awake, then my partner would go back to sleep for two hours. Like, it was incredibly stressful. It took her 19 hours to reach the city of Lviv, about twice as long as the drive normally takes. And her arrival was by no means the end of what she experienced under attack in Kyiv. She says she doesn't really feel safe anywhere in Ukraine. Psychologically, I do recognize that I probably... Personally, like I'm overcoming a big trauma, but it will take some time for me to recover. And we're still living in this situation, so I'm just giving myself some feelings. Like I, I'm free to express whatever I may be feeling. I may be crying in the morning, I may be feeling sad, I may be smiling, but and, I mean, that's the war and that's how we live here. By the time Dobrohorska left Kyiv, the city was already showing the scars of war. This apartment building destroyed by Russian rockets on the second night of the invasion. Oksana Gulienko says the explosion shattered the window and threw her across her bedroom. <laughs> Her daughter Katya defiantly sang the national anthem as she cleaned the glass. The United Nations says Russia is deliberately targeting civilians across the country. Many other Ukrainian cities quickly came under Russian fire, too. Close to the Russian border, Kharkiv was hit with heavy bombardment. The Ukrainian military saying it destroyed Russian vehicles and killed troops on the outskirts of the city. 
Russian forces took control of the infamous Chernobyl nuclear plant. Some of the heaviest fighting was near Kherson, where Russian forces seized a strategic water reservoir that supplies Crimea. Bombs fell in Mariupol, Sumy, and in Odessa, too. We see our defense um, system, which I think they were shooting down the missiles. So that one was really close. Maria Stepanova was awoken by the sounds of explosions. She could see what was happening from her apartment window in Odessa. When I woke up, I just didn't believe that they're attacking all the main cities. Like, uh, I knew, like, deep inside they will attack Donetsk and Lugansk region. Obviously, it was like we expected it. But I mean, I, till the last moment, I didn't do it. They will go to Kiev, Odessa. Stepanova and her husband Igor decided to try and get their four year old son, Rafael, out of the country. Speaking with CHCH News on their second attempt to reach the border. We tried to reach, like, their western part which is like near the Poland and Romanian border. In the morning, it was impossible. Like all the main roads, all main cities were attacked just an hour ago. Um, we were going through some small city here and I saw Ukrainian flag and I started crying because like we don't want to go anywhere, you know. Like it's our country, we want to stay here. They wouldn't make it out and decided to shelter in a basement in Odessa, worried about reports of Russians shooting at civilians on the roads. Two weeks later, this video emerged showing a Russian tank destroying a civilian vehicle and killing an elderly couple outside of Kyiv. The aftermath too horrific to show. In another video, a Russian tank deliberately ran over a car in Kyiv, but the driver miraculously survived. More than two million people have left Ukraine so far, the majority heading to Poland, with many heading on to other countries in Europe. Stepanova and her son eventually got out too, leaving Odessa by car and waiting 12 hours to cross the border into nearby Moldova to stay with relatives. For the first two days, my mind was like a mess. Like everyone was writing to me, what are we going to do, where are we going to go? I was thinking like I didn't know because I'm thinking when it will stop and when I can go home because really everything we have, like everything we had, like we just bought a new apartment. Uh, so you're there still. The images of suffering she sees coming out of Ukraine stir an anger and hatred inside of her, dampening the relief she feels to have gotten her son out. I have seen footage of like families running from Mariupol and Irpin, the cities which are surrounded. They're trying to escape and they're just shooting at them. Like the whole family is dead. It's just unbelievable. After the break, Russian shelling intensifies and increasingly targets civilians. He is bombing kindergarten. He is bombing hospitals. That's next as Voices of Ukraine, a CHCH News special report, continues. Welcome back. In the first days of the war, military analysts say stiff Ukrainian resistance and Russian supply shortages kept Putin's forces from advancing into major cities. And Russia's much larger air force was unable to control the skies. The setbacks led Russia to shift strategies, aiming to surround cities and bomb them into submission. Russian missile strikes Freedom Square in the center of Ukraine's second largest city. Local officials say others hit the residential areas of Kharkiv, leaving at least 10 dead and 35 wounded. Just 40 kilometers from the Russian border, the city has been heavily bombed since the invasion began. International organizations say the Russians are using cluster munitions designed to inflict severe damage and banned by the Geneva Convention. Children, including cancer patients, are taken to a basement for medical treatment as citizens head for bomb shelters or try and flee west. They are afraid. They're really afraid. Denis Samalenko was born and raised in Kharkiv and is moved to tears by the images coming out of his city. He escaped to western Ukraine days before the invasion began because he believed it was coming. Russia says it only attacks military targets in Ukraine, but Semelenko says he knows that isn't true. He is bombing kindergarten. He is bombing hospitals. The next day, Kharkiv is hit with more missiles, a university building and police department destroyed. This woman asks why her neighborhood is being shelled. We are regular folks, she says. Bodies lay on the ground as people who live here walk by in shock. People line up for groceries and medicine, angered and in disbelief. This man was recording a video when he narrowly missed being killed by a Russian missile striking the city. A lot of people die. Uh, kids, children die. It's uh 
It's terrible. Alexa Komanko knows what it's like to live amid Russian shelling in Kharkiv. She fled the city after enduring almost a week of heavy bombing and sleeping underground, hitching a ride on a bus provided by a local company evacuating employees to Lviv. She tells me she wants to go home and breaks down in tears when talking about the invasion and how much she misses her family stuck in Donetsk. As we spoke, the internet connection deteriorated. feel much better than, than in Kharkiv, but it's, it's really hard inside, yeah. Do you get to talk to your mom and sister in to... Donetsk? Yeah. Yeah, every day. Russian shelling hit a civilian street in the city of Chernev, where a dash cam caught the impact. Russian missiles are striking civilian targets in Kyiv, too. Two hit the main TV tower, killing five civilians. Ukrainian forces are prepared for an expected assault as a 65-kilometer-long Russian convoy of tanks and armored vehicles sits stalled for days outside the capital. Thousands of civilians are dead yesterday in Kharkiv. They're going to do it to Kyiv, my, my wonderful, gorgeous, historical Kyiv. Varvara Shmigalova's father, Krilo, is defending Kyiv with the city's territorial defense unit. She isn't able to speak with him often. He doesn't tell me a lot, to be honest, in the first place, because he's like he's trying still to be cheerful. And he's like, okay, you have to keep living, even if something happens. Like, it, like we made everything for you to be there. And I'm like, I don't even want to hear this right now. Her grandparents are there, too. And her mother just recently escaped a town outside Kyiv after a close call with a Russian attack. The neighboring village is completely destroyed. They're, like, it doesn't exist anymore. Where was the village is just like a hole in the land. Can I ask, how's it been emotionally, like this roller coaster the last week with your parents in a combat zone and you here just trying to do what you can? Imagine everyone you love and everything you love is taken hostage by terrorists, by, by crazy terrorists with a nuclear power. Northwest of Kyiv, civilians are trying to escape heavy fighting in Erpin, Hostomel, Vorzel, and Buka, leaving suburban homes behind and scrambling across the rubble of a bridge destroyed by Ukrainian troops to slow the Russian advance. Some of these people came under heavy shelling in their homes. This woman says she spent the night huddled with her children in a doorway for safety. The sound is so scary and the whole building is sh shaken. A family of four was killed after a Russian shell landed in the road as they walked away from the bridge on their way to Kyiv. They were killed instantly. The way that uh, they are getting out is uh, basically just finding a quiet moment and uh, just just making their way at their own risk. And uh, a lot of people actually now have chosen to barricade themselves into their houses and their apartments. Lesia Vasilenko is a Ukrainian member of parliament who is helping evacuate women and children from Kyiv and the surrounding towns. But the immense danger led her to send her three kids, including her nine-month-old baby, to stay with her parents. First of March is the day of the school that I will remember forever and most, uh, because this is the day that I also had to say goodbye to them. She's not the only one. This father is sending his family out of her pen and away from the fighting. After the break, Ukrainians push back with protests in front of Russian troops. Her son is Ukraine and <laughs> not the Russian Federation. And a maternity ward in a besieged town is hit by a Russian bomb, injuring pregnant women and killing a child. That's next as Voices of Ukraine, a CHCH News special report, continues. Welcome back. More than two weeks into this war and still, the Russian military has been unable to make much progress beyond what they achieved in the first days. Russian troops only occupy one major city, the strategically important port of Kherson. But the people who live there say Russia does not control their city as they protest the occupation. Russian troops walk the streets and the loud noise of tanks fill the air in the southern strategic city of Kherson. Yesterday and today was awful. 22-year-old travel agent Daria Moronshuk keeps the lights off after dark to try and avoid being targeted by a Russian bomb. She says Russian troops are only a couple hundred meters from her home, occupying a store and a police station. In my street, I saw uh, they here. She says her son was hit by rocket and artillery fire many times as Russian troops moved into the city, killing civilians and causing widespread destruction. They bombed the school near me. They bombed four houses, big houses, 
they burn the, the big shop center, take our food, take our drink. They drink a lot of alcohol drinks. Can you still get food, food and medicine if you go to a store? It's, uh, it's, it's hard for me, but I have food in my home. Um, I'm afraid to go outside. I'm afraid to, because I don't know. I have uh, a dog and uh, yesterday I didn't go for a walk with him. The Russian military says it has taken control of the city. It's the only major city Russia has been able to occupy since the war began. But Moranchuk says while the Russians are in town, they do not control its people. It is many fake information about uh, Kherson. Kherson's mayor says the Russians entered the city council and they made a deal where if civilians follow a set of rules, the Ukrainian flag will still fly. Kherson is Ukraine and <laughs> not the Russian Federation. Ukrainians are taking to the streets in Kherson and other towns, facing off with armed Russian troops with only flags in their hands, chanting and singing the national anthem. Moranchuk says Russians are using the population as a human shield. Russian soldiers uh, hide between civils, between people like me. To the east in besieged Mariupol, 200,000 people are lining up for water, living without food, electricity or heat, unable to even properly bury their dead. Residential areas have been pummeled with merciless Russian shelling. Multiple attempts to set up humanitarian corridors out of the city have failed due to Russia breaking temporary ceasefires. Mariupol is under continuous shelling from the artillery and bombing. Uh, each hour, each minute, each second. The Ukrainian military says this aerial footage shows Russian tanks in the streets. New satellite images show the extent of the damage. This is before the invasion began, and this is after. This used to be a grocery store and shopping mall, but the buildings have suffered heavy damage. But it was a strike on a maternity hospital that has horrified Ukrainians the most. <laughs> Ukrainian officials say this is the aftermath, wounding at least 17 pregnant women and killing three people, including a child. There's a massive crater in the courtyard outside that officials say is where the bomb landed. Inside, the hospital rooms have been destroyed with blown out windows and broken furniture. Officials releasing photos showing pregnant women escaping and an image of one who appears to be in labor. Russia claims there were Ukrainian combat positions in the building. Still to come, Ukraine wants Western nations to impose a no-fly zone, but NATO is worried about the war escalating into a direct conflict with Russia. Welcome back. Since the start of the war, Western nations have supported Ukraine with humanitarian aid and weapons. But Ukraine said over and over that more is needed, specifically a no-fly zone to stop Russian airstrikes. Promising to fight them in the forests, in the fields, on the shores, and in the streets, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky evoked Winston Churchill's famous Second World War speech as he addressed the British House of Commons this week, once again asking NATO to enforce a no-fly zone, meaning NATO warplanes would prevent Russian airstrikes by either escorting Russian aircraft out or shooting them down. We are asking for it uh, for the no-fly zone not not as a victim but as a partner a responsible partner who knows very well that we are unable to to cover uh and protect all of ukraine and all of ukraine includes five nuclear power stations if those blow up you're looking at a nuclear catastrophe that will affect you but nato is concerned about a direct conflict with russia something that vladimir putin put on the table on the very first night of the war warning the international community if they interfered there would be consequences greater than any they had faced in history. Days into the war, he put Russia's nuclear weapons units on high alert. But Daniel Bilak, originally from Grimsby, now living in and defending Kyiv, says the West needs to stand up to Putin. We just kind of start being afraid of this guy. He's got nothing. And the key with, with Putin is that, that he is he's a bully and bullies are cowards. And we've proven, we've outed him. Several rounds of negotiations between Ukraine and Russia did not yield much progress. Despite the grim reality, everyone I spoke with remains hopeful about the future. Ukrainians will, will never surrender. Obviously, people are, are afraid, but there, there's no panic. And there's just, there's just 
massive, overwhelming resolve. I believe in our army, uh, our best people, and they know, they have education, they have skills, they prepare, uh, they smart and educated people. I believe in, uh, in them. I just want to live in peace. Uh, I want to do science. I want to program. I want to develop yourself, be useful for my country, for this world. Truly, we we will win. They're like, we will win anywhere. Uh, no choice. Because like uh, they kill us many times, like uh, Stalin, kill, uh, Stalin killed a lot of Ukrainians. Tsar Nicholas killed a lot of Ukrainians. Lenin killed a lot of Ukrainians, but we will win. It's our destiny. Uh, I help uh, people who need it, uh, neighbors. Uh, we change who water, who needs uh, maybe food. We help each other. Mm. We post Instagram uh, for people who need to uh, help. And uh, we say uh, it's hard time, but uh, Everything will be okay, and we will be Ukraine. Thanks for joining us for Voices of Ukraine. Visit CHCH's YouTube page for more of my extended interviews with people directly impacted by the war. For CHCH News, I'm Matt Ingram. Good night.